Well, good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Changing Times, Changing Therapies, Keeping Up with Advancements in Cell and Gene Therapies. My name is Ryan Muse and I'll be your X Talks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. Now, webinars are designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit your questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you require any assistance along the way, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this same chat panel. At this time, know that all participants are in listen-only mode, and please note that the event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank Worldwide Clinical Trials, who developed the content for this presentation. Worldwide Clinical Trials is a global mid-sized contract research organization that provides top performing preclinical and phase one to four clinical development services to the biotechnology and pharmaceutical industries. Major therapeutic areas of focus include cardiovascular, metabolic, neuroscience, oncology, and rare diseases. Operating in 60 plus countries with offices in North and South America, Eastern and Western Europe, Russia, and Asia, Worldwide is powered by its more than 2,800 employee experts. Now I would like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Ms. Durst has more than 15 years of clinical research experience and has broad therapeutic area experience including oncology, gene therapy, dermatology, ophthalmology, cardiovascular studies ranging from phase one to four. She has overseen all aspects of startup as well as maintenance activities in a variety of countries worldwide in both early and late phase trials with both small and large clients. Dr. Jenkins has more than 16 years of experience in the field of biological safety, gene therapy, corporate development, human projections, and biosafety compliance in academic private research institute and clinical settings. He has experience overseeing a broad range of entity research compliance and has served as IRB and IBC chair at over 1,200 convened meetings. We have Mr. Ansel, who has worked in clinical research for more than 10 years with a focus almost exclusively in rare and pediatric diseases, including non-malignant hematology, autoimmune diseases, metabolic disorders, movement disorders, and other genetic conditions. At Worldwide, he leads and supports corporate initiatives within rare and pediatric diseases and maintains relationships with over 45 patient-focused advocacy organizations. And Ms. Kathy Purvis has over five years of clinical research experience across all phases and many therapeutic areas, including oncology, neurology, gastroenterology, women's health, pediatrics, orthopedics, and cardiovascular studies. Within oncology, she has been involved in multiple gene therapy trials. She has also been involved in all aspects of study startup as well as maintenance activities all the way up to NDA submission. But now, without further ado, I'd like to hand the mic over to our first speaker today, Derek Ansel. You may begin when you're ready. Thanks, Ryan. Just wanted to say thank you, everyone, so much for taking some time today to talk about cell and gene therapies. As you all know, these are very complex uh, therapeutics, uh, have their own challenges, they have their own hurdles that we all must overcome. And the years 2021 and 2022 have made it significantly harder to run a cell and gene therapy trial. So we have an expert panelist here today to talk about challenges that we've seen around sites, site activation, pandemic-induced stressors, and more. The next slide showcases our agenda, uh, which we'll have Chris and uh, talk about the current state of cell and gene therapies with an introduction of what an IBC is. We'll hand it over to Dana, who will talk about how the pandemic has really uh, restricted a lot of our movement in the cell and gene therapy space when it comes to our sites. And Kathy will talk about centralized IBC IRB services. And then I'll round it out with just some, some trends that we've seen with ASGCT happening last week, specific with rare disease and where we see the future of cell and gene therapy going. And with that, I will hand it over to Chris. Thank you, Derek. First to start off, uh, we have a poll question, so we're interactive here. So are you currently or planning on running a gene and cell therapy clinical trial? So please, if you're able to, uh, find, uh, find that mouse button and give us an answer, and we'll wait a few seconds here and then move on after our quick poll with the results and start our, start our talk. 
Very good. It looks like the audience is very engaged. Thank you everyone for participating in this poll. Let's go ahead and look at the results that we have from this. Uh, we have 71% of you have selected no, and then 29% have selected yes. So thank you very much for your participation. And Chris, it's back to you. Thank you. It's good to see that uh, we've got folks currently active as well as those who might be considering on these kinds of trials. So uh, what I'd like to do is go through a little bit of a history of uh, uh, the gene therapy landscape and go through a bit of the past and present to where we are today um, and then touch a little bit on IBCs. So first off, I, I want to discuss um, a, a little bit of the gene therapy landscape so on the next slide. So his, I, I use cancer treatments as a good barometer because many of the gene and cell therapy treatments we have here today are in oncology. So you know, initial treatments were surgery and radiation therapy and chemotherapy in the 40s. Uh, combination therapy started in the 60s and more targeted therapies in the 80s. And we started seeing the advent of immunotherapies in the 90s and then uh, the first clinical trials into human subjects at the turn of the century um, in 2000 with uh, variations of success, which we're gonna see on the next slide, a couple of slides here in terms of that success. Um, before we get to that part, um, I'd like to just put a couple of definitions in front of us. Uh, gene therapy and cell therapy have quite a bit of, of uh, uh, meanings and, and uh, definitions across a lot of organizations. So I like to use the FDA and NIH Office of Science Policies definitions here. Uh, so for FDA, uh, we're, we define uh, or the FDA defines the uh, gene therapy to modify or manipulate the expression of a gene or to alter the biological properties of living cells for therapeutic use. So in the FDA's vision, the gene therapies are those products that mediate their effects by transcription or translation of that gen transfer genetic uh, material or by specifically altering the host, uh, such as uh, the human, uh, genetic sequences. And we can do that in several ways. We can do that with gene replacement, we can do that with uh, disruption and inhibition, we can do that with gene editing, and we can do that with gene transfer. And so uh, uh, in the case of gene replacement, that's replacing a disease-causing gene with a healthy copy of that gene. Uh, we can inactivate or disrupt a gene so that it's not uh, functioning properly, that's the disruption inhibition. With gene editing, uh, we can use uh, technology like molecular scissors of CRISPR, uh, that you may have heard about uh, to uh, change or correct uh, uh, an undesirable mutation and then with gene transfer to introduce a new modified gene to help against specific disease. On to the next slide. And then with the NIH, uh, in the U.S. and uh, the ex-U.S., there are oversight bodies that have uh, committees at a local level that look at how are these genetically modified products handled. So how is the uh, product received, stored, prepared, administered, dosed into a subject, possibly shed out of the individual, and ultimately disposed of um, in terms of all materials that come in contact? It could be uh, low-risk agents like DNA plasmids and mRNA. It could be higher-risk uh, agents such as replication-competent oncolytic viruses or uh, 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 bacteria, or uh, also could be uh, patients' own cells that have been genetically modified with a viral vector like a lenti or ret retrovirus. So in the case of the NIH in the United States for the oversight of institutional biosafety committees, they define this gene transfer or the deliberate transfer of recombinant or synthetic nucleic acids, uh, such as DNA or RNA, uh, uh, into human research uh, participants as what triggers an institutional biosafety committee risk assessment review under Section 1B of the NIH guidelines. Long story short, that very dense, long document of the NIH guidelines for research involving recombinant synthetic nucleic acid molecules specifies the oversight mechanism that an IBC adheres to at each dosing site. And next slide, please. And so a little bit of data. Um, so from 1995 to about 2014 or 15, uh, where this is sourced from the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy and their uh, Inform of Pharma Intelligence reports. Uh, we have multiple reports uh, that are issued every quarter. My favorite is the Q2 of 2021. They uh, has this graph of initiated products um, by year, uh, along with the number of uh, uh, and phases. Uh, a little bit of the color was lost on the phase with the, the webinar, but uh, most of these products in the darker color are in preclinical phase, then you have phase one, phase two, and phase three. And so the early days of clinical trials, uh, and, uh, many of us know, are, you know, in 1999, we had the unfortunate death of Jesse Gelsinger from a recombinant adenovirus uh, for an OTC met uh, metabolic disease. Um, and on top of that, we had several uh, uh, adverse events with uh, uh, retroviruses over in Europe. 
uh, for ADA skid. And so uh, the field stagnated. There was a lot of people uh, that, that left the field and, and didn't uh, work with uh, genetically modified material. And so it wasn't until late 2000s, early portion of last decade, that we started to see uh, some successes in the areas of oncolytic viruses, such as Amgen's metastatic melanoma product, uh, Imlogic, which uh, uh, encodes for GMCSF. We started to see uh, 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 some successes with uh, advent of chimeric antigen receptor therapies, CAR-T, uh, such as Emily Whitehead um, be, uh, just celebrating her 10-year um, anniversary of dosing of being cancer-free. Um, so uh, from UPenn and the team of Carl June and uh, uh, Bruce and, and others uh, uh, at the UPenn team, cellular facilities. And then we also saw the, in the last few years of uh, adeno-associated viruses and rare disease. So uh, first approval being in the U.S. Uh, Spark Therapeutics as uh, Luxturna. Um, and then we also have uh, more recently the uh, AAV for the treatment of spinal muscular atrophy type 1 from Avexis Novartis gene therapies, uh, Zolgensma uh, uh, for that type 1 as well. And so uh, we're seeing an increase in these trials. It's uh, turning more from a slight increase into a logarithmic curve. And so for these trials in the U.S., the IBC is going to be an additional regulatory component on top of the IRB as part of that. But a bit more data is coming up here. So next, next slide. I want to talk a little bit about um, where these phases are and how they're increasing. So um, over those quarters, over the last year, we just wanted to highlight the uh, general increase in phase one, two, and three trials um, that we're getting more products into FDA registration, as well as more in preclinical. There's heavy investment by uh, biopharma and pharma industry into uh, these backbones of adeno-associated viruses, CAR-T, Lenti, um, uh, uh, other uh, viral vector oncolytic modes, as well as bacterial vectors and, and other technologies such as CRISPR, uh, which are uh, uh, using molecular scissors on, on uh, DNA uh, uh, construction, are just now entering the clinic for indications like sickle cell and hemophilia. And so uh, the 10 time increase from the 200 uh, products in development 2012 to 2022 to 2000, um, we are seeing uh, a major boom um, in this therapeutic approach. We're seeing some successes. There's also going to be some challenges. We'll talk about those as well too. Um, and so uh, the concept of you know replacing a bad gene or a malfunctioning gene or uh, uh, disrupting an overactive gene with a good gene uh, or in its correct form has always been there, but now we're finally finding the right tools and mechanisms to, to uh, uh, express those genes and deliver those payloads um, in, in more fine-tuned ways year, year after year. And so that's just increasing, and that's where we're getting more fine-tuned capabilities. On to the next slide. And so uh, most of the, as I mentioned at the very beginning, the oncology is always uh, the, the predominant uh, indicator of, of where this field is going, primarily with uh, uh, cellular therapies as well as increase in oncolytic viruses. Right behind is rare disease. Uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of interest in adeno-associated viruses, serotypes one through nine, as well as some uh, novel ones coming out. And so we're seeing <clears throat> quite a few uh, uh, of those products. And then neurological uh, metabolic products are really increasing and then ophthalmology as well. And so uh, the rest of the slide sort of explains itself there. So let's go to the next slide there. All right. And so then in terms of the approximately 1,000 gene therapies and pipeline for rare disease uh, or for rare diseases, many are on uh, oncologies we mentioned before, primarily myelomas, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, AMLs, acute myelogenous leukemias, B-cell lymphomas, and ovarian cancer. Next slide. I love this list from this report. So in the Q, uh, Q1 of 2022 is a report from that uh, ASGCT uh, landscape report. They go through in the year approved by country and add in a nice highlighted approach the new uh, drugs that have been added into their various uh, locations. So we start off with with products in China, 2004, 2005, we had a product in the Philippines, uh, 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 mutant cyclin G1, Rex and G. There's been a bit of a pause period. We had a few approvals in Russia and, and a few other countries. And then Im Imlogic was the first with a uh, with the replication, uh, 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 replication uh, replicating HSV for for Imlogic uh, for metastatic melanoma in 2015. 
And then the CAR-T product started to come. We had Kim Raya and Yes Carta from Novartis and Kite. We had Lexterna in 2017. And then that sort of opened the floodgates and we're seeing multiple approvals each year um, in 2019, 2020, 2021. And I believe we also have a few more in, uh, already for 2022 with uh, Legend Biotech, if we want to go on to the next slide, um, with their uh, CAR-T product with uh, Janssen for Carvicti. And then also getting uh, uh, approvals from Bluebird Bio, uh, Celgene Juno for Abecma in Japan. Uh, but also uh, just more CAR-T products there. And so we're expecting this to continue. I have some uh, uh, additional data here and a couple more slides of uh, the FDA's uh, considerations on this space, but uh, just wanted to highlight where those approvals are, which countries they are, uh, again, from this fantastic report from the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So uh, back in 2019, Dr. Scott Gottlieb had predicted by 2025, we're going to be approving the FDA 10 to 20 gene and cell therapy products a year. So this increase of two to three is going to increase three or four fold uh, over the next several years. Uh, we're going to see those products move through phase one, two, and three uh, uh, in, into that pre-registration registration phase. So we're seeing this field start to mature. Um, as as uh, mentioned earlier, oncology is leading the way with rare disease right behind, and we do expect uh, gene therapy to incorporate incorporate multiple uh, uh, mechanism of approaches or combination therapies. So you might have an adeno-associated virus paired with a, a, a CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, in order to cut, cut the area out and use the AAV to deliver the gene in. And so it pr uh, provides um, uh, the additional oversight mechanism and regulatory oversight, both in the U.S. with IBCs, but also ex-U.S. with committees uh, such as genetically modified organism committees in the U.K., IBCs or biosafety committees in Australia, um, as well as other uh, regions around the world. Next slide, please. So that covers the summary of kind of the landscape of gene and cell therapy. Now I want to talk a little bit about Institutional Biosafety Committee. What is this committee? Why does it exist? It's already on top of the Institutional Review Board and the Ethics Review. So what is the IBC reviewing? Uh, so in short, the Institutional Biosafety Committee is all about the drug. Where is the drug on site at every dosing location? So, and, and an IBC's job is to minimize any potential exposure of that drug to unintended individuals outside of the patient, outside of the research subject. So an IBC is conducting a risk assessment on what is this agent? How is it made? Is it a virus? Is it a bacteria? Is it a CAR-T? Is it a DNA plasmid? Is it an mRNA or a viral vector or COVID vaccine? Where, what is that drug? And then given those characteristics, can it have potential mechanisms for it to get out into the environment? Can it get exposed to a pharmacist? Can a nurse get exposed during a, a, a inserting an IV line or an intramuscular injection? Uh, can the patient's family or subject's family be exposed, especially in the case of uh, adeno-associated viruses uh, where you may wish to have siblings dosed and you don't want to have uh, uh, antibodies form against that serotype of AAV. So an IBC's job is how to minimize that exposure. Next slide, please. And so that collection of experience comes in the form of scientific members who have molecular biology backgrounds, biosafety professionals, clini uh, clinical staff, um, and they're reviewing the facilities of the AB, every dosing location. So a university academic medical center will have these, a, a, a clinic or a hospital system um, not affiliated will also have these. And they are looking at the facilities, the training of the staff, the nurses and pharmacists, and those who handle the drug specifically, and the procedures they have around disposal and receipt and, and storage and administration of these products. And so the, at all that summed together issues is at a, uh, conducted at a convened IBC meeting, which is then issues a determination letter into one of four biosafety levels, one, two, three, and four. And so most clinical trials and clinical products in the uh, clinic are biosafety level one, such as an mRNA product, or, biosafety, or approved at biosafety level two, such as viral vector products and CAR-T with blood, uh, blood products in the United States. And so the IBC's job will, will convene that review, re issue recommendations to the study team issuing that uh, that study uh, in front of the, the committee, and then a determination letter similar to the IRB will be forthcoming that will determine ap approval uh, or contingencies of approval. Next slide, please. And so, um, as I mentioned before earlier, that this risk assessment encompasses a bunch of different aspects. So the study agent, the preparation, the administration procedures, the facilities, and as well as the overall biosafety program. There are two different types of sites that have IBCs. There's similar in the IRB world, you have central sites or standalone clinics, standalone hospitals um, that may not have a formal environmental health and safety department. They may utilize a central pr uh, provider or a outside uh, body provider, such as a, a group that forms IBCs, simpler 
similar to the central IRB model to run an IBC at their institution. And so it'll be done in full. Other entities, mostly academic medical centers, have uh, conduct research with bench and animal research with uh, 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 PI is funded from the NIH with uh, uh, molecular research, and so they pr primarily those IBCs review bench, uh, uh, you know, uh, lab bench, wet lab uh, uh, research, as well as animal research prior uh, uh, to it going into the clinic. And so these IBCs at these universities, 19 out of 20 protocols are reviewing are actually not clinical, and their staff, their IBC staff, are tend not to be clinically focused. And so the, that's one mechanism that a lot of folks uh, uh, in the clinical world, especially in CRO sponsor world may not appreciate is these IVCs are not at universities are not constructed primarily to review clinical trials or more primarily re, uh, to review uh, bench and animal research. Uh, next slide please. And so um, inside of that, uh, the study agent, we look at, you know, how is the agent modified? What, what delete, deletions in the agent from its wild type form of say HIV as a lentivirus are done? Is it a first generation? Is it on two plasmids? Is it on three plasmids? That makes it safer. Um, are those modifications able to be returned back to the, that it can capture in, inside of the host, uh, the genetic material to come back? Um, can the, uh, uh, during the manufacture, are they testing to see if there's replication competent lentivirus or replication competent virus um, during the test uh, that passes the FDA guidance? Um, is there innate hazards with that agent? Um, you know, if a vaccinia virus or a, 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 that can, uh, uh, is it not as attenuated as, as uh, some other variations can cause blisters uh, uh, can, and can cause uh, uh, deleterious effects on us if it was exposed to a pharmacist during preparation or to a nurse during administration and there was a needle stick exposure or a, a spill or a splash. So that's why we want to know those handling parameters of who's picking up drug, who's preparing the drug, who's transporting it, who's administering it into the patient, what do those facilities such as a laminar flow hood have inside them in the pharmacy or in the clinic. And then, you know, if they're not familiar with these products, what training do they do they have over bloodborne pathogens or biological shipping, um, as well as oc health, uh, occupational health. If someone is exposed, does this clinic or the facility have a mechanism to get folks into a uh, uh, seen by a, a physician in, in case there's monitoring that needs to be done for that product. Next slide, please. So in, in summary of, of the IBC, um, you're going to hear a little bit about how this impacts study startup and how it impacts the start of clinical trials. The IBC's job is cradle to grave of where the drug is at that institution. Historically, most IBCs at academic medical centers meet on a monthly basis, once a month. Um, historically, uh, the last couple of years, uh, uh, we are running trials fa ever faster. Uh, we are, uh, you know, some studies such as COVID vaccines needed, needed sites approved in two weeks or in a week uh, from being selected to needing to be able to administer product to, to patients. And so uh, the importance of, of speed with IBCs is putting a, a tremendous amount of pressure on the internal resources of universities that have IBCs and that and those volunteer faculty who sit on those IBCs and it's putting pressure on the CROs and the sponsors to find mechanisms to um, conduct the review as safe as possible under the the rules that are here in the United States but also to get their study going given the the needs um, both with COVID but also in oncology rare disease and and infectious disease. Next slide please. So most of you might be at institutions that don't have an IBC and you see this growth of the curve. Um, what do I do if I don't have an IBC? Well, you can use a commercial IBC. Full disclosure, I run a uh, commercial IBC called Clinical Biosafety Services. We run over 500 IBCs uh, for entities in the United States and Canada uh, to specifically review all those mechanisms we just discussed in as quick and fast a manner uh, compliantly with the NIH guidelines for CROs and sponsors and sites. And so uh, it's very similar to the central IRB model, which you'll hear a little bit more in just a couple minutes here um, from our, my colleagues, um, and primarily used by the clinics, uh, medical centers, and hospital systems with more and more academic centers, especially stra uh, strep strapped for resources and staffing are starting to outsource this as well, similar to how central IRB uptake 20 years ago really began um, in the central IRB world. Next slide, please. And so you can use an IBC uh, that's externally uh, uh, formed uh, if you don't have one, if you don't feel you have the experience there, if you have administrative or bureaucratic hurdles in forming an, uh, an institutional IBC, sometimes it's just easier to use a third party. Um, typically, uh, central or external IBCs are operate on a 
on a faster window than typically what local IBCs uh, have, and they are an impartial or unbiased because they are, um, they're not composed of faculty at the institution unless the site wishes, but they can have a mix. Um, you can have faculty from the institution, non-faculty from uh, provided by the IBC provider um, in order to conduct that review that still is looking at all the facilities, procedures, and handling. Next slide. I want to uh, keep that one going. Okay, so uh, the gene therapy era. Uh, I just want to close with some exciting, you know, developments. We know we know that the the field sees advances almost every day. So first, you know, we've got reports from Columbia University on experimental gene therapy reversing sickle cell disease for years. We've got uh, if you want to keep going on some of the the posts on here. Um, we've got CRISPR-Cas9 uh, boosting uh, effectiveness of ultrasound cancer therapy. We've got uh, uh, our next one that we have is uh, gene therapy to benefit uh, children with immunodeficiencies. Uh, with four dozen children um, with SCID who received a corrective gene by a virus have now working immune systems two to three years later, according to uh, three independent clinical trials. We are seeing these successes repeat themselves. There are challenges, and we'll talk about those, uh, but gene therapy in one eye improves vision in both eyes. Uh, with Lieber hereditary optic neuropathy, it's a mitochondrial disorder that causes blindness, uh, but they're seeing uh, benefits in, uh, in their in their untreated eyes, and not just uh, one eye, but both eyes. We're seeing ALS models um, uh, uh, symptoms uh, in ALS improve with CRISPR-based entities, so future technologies that even haven't hit clinical trials yet that are coming with successes. So the, all, all of this momentum, there's funding sources that are coming in from uh, uh, venture capital and private sources. Uh, biotechs are seeing these successes. That's getting big tin farm in. Uh, we're seeing uh, again, you gene therapy for hemophilia A in phase three um, successes as well. This is, this is just to, to highlight the tip of the iceberg of we're going to see more of these trials. We're going to see this regulatory component for the IBC in the U.S. and GMO committees ex-U.S. Um, and it's an exciting time. So with that, I believe this is near to my last slide uh, with this quote. So uh, Karen Bukalik and Charles uh, uh, Gersbach, uh, I love this quote from them. They said that gene therapy is arguably the most exciting area of biotechnology at this moment, both due to recent progress and because of the possibilities on the horizon, on precedent levels of control over nucleic acid delivery, modulation of the immune system, and pre precise manipulation of the human genome with technologies not imaginable 10 years ago are going to unlock new areas of medicine over the next 10 years. One of the greatest challenges in the field of uh, cell and gene therapy in the near future will be in the area of regulatory sciences and accommodating the unique challenges posed by these innovative technologies. Next slide. And I will uh, turn it over to my colleague, Dana. And Dana has a poll question for the audience. And thank you everyone for a time on overview of uh, gene therapy field and IBCs. Dana, it's all yours. Thank you, Chris. All right, so the poll question here, has the pandemic impacted your gene and cell therapy clinical trials? Yes, so as with the last one, the audience can select on any of the answers that they see in front of them and then click Submit to participate. We'll give everyone a few seconds to consider their answer, how it best applies to themselves and their company. Again, wondering, has the pandemic impacted your gene and cell therapy clinical trials? It looks like most of you have submitted an answer, so thank you very much for participating. Let's go ahead and look at the results for this one. We have 65% coming in for yes, and then 35% coming in for no. So thank you very much. And Dana, it's back to you. Thank you. Uh, that's a very interesting metric. I was assuming it would be a lot higher for the yes impact. So, um, but today, you know, as a reminder, my name is Dana. I'm senior director over the site activation team within the oncology group here at Worldwide. Um, I've been dedicated to site activation for the past 10 years. And I'm asked weekly, if not even more often right now, like what is going on, these timelines, the delays, it's just such a big impact that we're seeing. Um, and I know today we're talking about gene and cell therapy, but really the pandemic has impacted everybody. Um, and again, I oversee the oncology studies here. So really this is what we're seeing from an oncology perspective of you know, um, the delays and kind of what we've done here is kind of outlined really, you know, the, the three main things. So first off, starting with uh, staffing. So we've all heard on the call, the great resignation. Um, you know, it's it's not only in this industry. I mean, you go to McDonald's and you ask for a cheeseburger and it's 15 minutes later, you get it. There's no there's no quick service anymore. Um, everyone is struggling through the, the pandemic. Um, and here within the industry, you know, we're seeing a lot of, of turnover. Obviously there's going to be zero competitiveness, people jumping from company to company. Um, you know, from the, the CRO side, people want to go to the biotech side, vice versa. 
but really from a site perspective, you know, these, these study staff team members, they, they went home and did full-time work remote during the pandemic. And now that, you know, things are coming back to on-site setting, these individuals want that full remote um, staff or work from home opportunities. So we're losing, the sites are losing a lot of staff to come to potentially CROs to work that full remote um, position. We're also seeing where uh, studies, you know, research nurses within the, the study staff are being redistributed to support COVID patients. Um, it doesn't only impact the, the study team members, you know, but we're also seeing where pre-review committee staff, IRB staff, all of that staff is also limited. So what that means is less meetings, uh, delays in approvals. So again, it's just a trickle effect of delays and site activations. Um, and then training, you know, if people are able to find people to fill in positions, there's a training, um, you know, time period that's gonna take these individuals to get up and running. You know, we're coming from a seasoned staff from the year 2020 and 2019, where things moved a little quicker and now in 2022, we're working with new individuals. They've got to learn their processes, their SOPs, and it's just going to take them a little longer to do their day-to-day -day job until they really get a good grasp of it. Um, here within Worldwide, from a pre-award standpoint, we're actually reevaluating our metrics and what we're communicating to clients, um, and specifically for the U.S. I mean, really, the impacts have really been in the U.S., for the majority of part of, of it. Um, I joked with a client the other day, we're about to go into a global expansion. And I said, EU is gonna be a breeze. You know, it's gonna be, we know exactly what to expect. And, you know, it's gonna be, you know, what, what we're expecting. Like the US is just so un uncertain right now, not understanding where our sites are and with the staffing. Um, moving over to this, the study backlog. So our sites have multiple options for studies. Um, you know, when you're looking, when you receive a, a feasibility questionnaire to, to potentially consider for a new, um, you know, study, you know, what we ask sites is, you know, let's be open, let's be realistic, you know, are, if you're interested, can you support the study? Do you have the bandwidth right now? Um, you know, a lot of sites are coming to us and say, this is really interesting. I just don't have the staff to do it. Could you contact me in like three to six months? Or we have staff that just say, I just, I can't, we can't accept anything right now. So, you know, that open, realistic, you know, uh, feedback is definitely appreciated. And the other thing about that is when sites are filling out feasibility questionnaires, um, you know, we have the standard section of what's your IRB process, what's your contract budget negotiation process. Don't respond as you would in 2019, respond currently. You know, it's definitely gonna be two separate answers um, because really, we as a CRO and clients, we rely on your feedback from the FQ. And that's kind of where we build the basis of the baseline for site activation projections. We all know site activation projections impacts the rest of the study, patient enrollment. You know, so if site activation doesn't go on time, it's we're not going to deliver on time. So, um, you know, honestly, you know, it's like the feedback from you guys from the site side is definitely appreciated from a realistic stand, um, point of view. And don't be concerned. Don't think that if you say it's going to take an X amount of time, you know, we're not going to select you. That's not going to be the case. Uh, we want, you know, to have the right sites and we want to be able to account on that site once they're selected to really get going on the specific study and get things moving. You're going to be prioritizing your studies. Another thing, you know, is based off of what your your site and your patient needs are, and potentially your specific interest. Um, so it's good to understand kind of where in the queue of um, the studies do we sit, and to expect when you're going to start working on that particular study. Uh, another thing that I'm seeing quite often is uh, study staff reassignment. For example, we've got a study. Uh, back in February, we got the initial budget negotiator assignment. You know, we get all excited. We're going to start seeing some initial budget feedback, and it's the end of May, and we're on a third budget negotiation person. So, three five month delay. It's 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 a lot, and um, you know, it's it's a lot to go back to the clients too, and kind of indicate, you know, this is this is what's happening. It's a lot of time and resources from the CRO uh, following up. We've got non-responsive sites and then also from the client perspective the clients are trying to engage with these sites as well so you know time money um, and not delivery so uh, speaking with Chris uh, and some of our preps you know he, he made a good comment um, he was speaking with UNC Chapel Hill last fall and they indicated they were down 70 percent of their staffing for research and study coordinators so in result they're having to decline studies 70 um, percent so it's a big percentage so um, 
the impact is, is definitely there from um, all, all sites, I would imagine. And lastly, for our patients, I don't think um, you know hesitancy and fear to return to the medical setting is really a big thing. I think it was more when you know we're at the peak of COVID, but it still is a thing. Um, so that's something to keep in mind that some of the patients might not be willing to come into the medical setting just yet. Um, we got to look at potentially negative impact on site enrollment. Um, I hear all the time from sites, I've got a, I got a patient ready, I've got a patient ready. Well, you know, obviously we need a contract executed, we need IRB approval in place, IBC approval in place. And you know, if we don't have it, that patient, that patient's sick, they're gonna have to move on. Um, they can't sit around and wait for the, the documentation to be ready and activated. Um, so they're gonna they're gonna have to move on. And that's very unfortunate. You know, patients are very important. Um, so and then lastly, you know, our staff, the study staff, they're, they're overwhelmed. Potentially they can oversee a patient going into an appropriate point of disease progression. Um, our study protocols, you know, they have timelines, um, you know, uh, a chemo window. So if uh, a study staff is just kind of way overwhelmed and just can't focus on the patient themselves, they're gonna miss things like that and opportunities for that patient to go on to. <clears throat> So like in summary, you know, I think Kathy, she's going to talk about um, the, the, the benefits of utilizing central services here in a minute. But Kathy's client just recently came to her and said, could you provide me a list of all the sites that have been impacted by the pandemic? And the response was easy. Every single one of the sites have been impacted. Obviously, the severity per site has differ, um, but it definitely has impacted all the sites. So that's it for me. And uh, Kathy, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Dana. So we do have a poll question here. Have you used a centralized IRB and IBC provider? Yes, so that a poll question should be appearing on everyone's screen right now. You're all voting very fast. Thank you for participating. Again, select either yes or no, and then click submit. Question again being, have you used a centralized IRB IBC provider? Looks like most of you have submitted a vote, so thank you very much for participating. Let's look at your results. We have 59% of you selecting no, and then 41% selecting yes. Uh, thanks again, and Kathy, it's back to you. Thank you, everyone. Um, yes, so I, I'm not um, terribly surprised that uh, the no's took the majority. I think that it's more common to use a centralized IRB, but to um, use a, a centralized IRB and IBC service is a little less common. Um, I am finding over the, the last several years that it's becoming a, a more common um, occurrence in research studies, which is great. It means that we can get uh, you know, uh, drugs out to um, patients much faster um, and studies out to, um, to potential patients much, fa much faster. So um, I just wanna talk about using centralized um, services. And um, as I noted, I think IRBs are, are pretty common. Most people are familiar um, with how a centralized IRB works, but um, you know, how does a centralized IBC work? Um, and also the concierge services, services that um, some central IBCs provide as well. So um, with an IRB submission, it's pretty much the same regardless of which provider you use. Um, most people might be familiar with the process of submitting to the IRB. Um, but for a centralized IBC, it's incredibly simple in my opinion. Um, as a CRO, if, if we're taking on um, that process for our client, we just send them simply the protocol, the investigator brochure, and the um, pharmacy manual. Such a simple submission. And then they do all the hard part, um, you know, looking those materials over. And of course, just like any submission, they'd come back to us with questions. But um, it's a very simple process and can save a lot of time. Um, and we'll talk about in a few minutes um, uh, you know, how, how we know if sites can even use centralized services. Um, but I want to talk about some benefits of using uh, one service provider. So one provider for IRB, IBC, and potentially concierge. Um, concierge services are provided uh, to assist sites utilizing their local IBC um, in quickly answering uh, their questions and filling out their, their local applications. Um, but some benefits of using centralized services are typically you'll have one point of contact or if you have more than one, um, they're connected. And so uh, 
they talk to each other in the background. You don't have to, um, you know, go searching for, uh, for answers. Sorry, if we can go back to the last slide, please. Um, and then you'll have more efficient monitoring of the overall um, status of submissions and approvals on the project. So um, you may have, they may have aligned systems that you'll have access to. Um, you may receive reports or may have regular check-ins on a study I'm currently working on um, where we're utilizing a centralized um, service. I have a weekly check-in where uh, we go over IRB, IBC, and concierge. Um, in addition, you'll have uh, faster turnaround times on approvals. Um, and then it's also less work on behalf of the sites. So if you're able to provide them with um, one service provider, they're also not having to go searching around um, to make submissions. They can either come directly to the CRO contacts or they have a contact as well um, with the centralized provider. I did wanna provide an example um, that we recently experienced. Uh, we have two sites here. Both of them um, utilize the central IBC. So that was um, very fast process and um, didn't impact their startup timelines at all. Um, they also both required a fully executed CTA to submit to the IRB. So um, that's a little less common. We'll see, you know, maybe a requirement of a fully executed CTA to perform the initiation visit um, or maybe a final CTA um, or getting final to submit to the IRB. Um, but to have a fully executed, that definitely um, impacts our timelines on the back end. And so um, with site one, we received the fully executed CTA. They uh, submitted to the IRB and we had an approval in less than 48 hours. So we were able to activate that site very quickly. Um, but site number two, uh, they utilized a separate industry IRB. So this was still what we might call or, or think of as a central um, IRB, but it was not the, the central provider that we had employed for the study. And um, it took a little over two weeks to receive IRB approval. Um, in addition to that, it was a lot more follow-up, um, a lot more time for the site. They had to complete the full application rather than just the site application. And um, they, it, for, for the CRO side, we were having to um, constantly go to the site for updates. Whereas if um, you know, we were able to use the, the central provider, we could have been asking for updates um, you know, through our, our contact at the provider. Uh, next slide, please. So now I wanted to um, tap in here to some benefits of concierge services. As I noted before, um, these are for local sites um, in assisting in completing their application. So um, with the concierge services, uh, they really become study experts and um, any questions that come in, they can answer very quickly. They assist in completing the local IBC applications. And sometimes if they have them on file, if they've worked with these sites a lot, they may even complete the application on behalf of the site and provide it to them for any updates. So it really takes so much time off of the process. Um, there's also a quick turnaround on, on any um, application questions. So recently we had a site um, using their local IBC. They sent us upwards of 30 questions and said they needed them back the next day. Um, had we not employed a concierge service, I, I think it probably would have taken several days to complete the questions. Um, just it would be a lot of digging through our FAQs, reaching out to sponsor um, to get those questions answered. Uh, we really weren't sure if the deadline could be made. They answered it in 35 minutes. That's how quickly those got back. Um, had we not made the deadline of the next day, then it would have been an entire month that we would have been delayed before they could submit to the IBC. So um, concierge can definitely uh, help shorten those timelines. Um, then it's also an extra layer of follow-up. So we at the CRO are following up with the site on all of their submissions, um, but so is the concierge service. So when you've got a local site and um, they have several committees already that they're working on. A lot of times um, 
even though committees might gate IRB, they don't necessarily gate IBC. So because IBC can traditionally take a lot longer, we're really pushing them to get that done quickly. And so it's just an extra layer of follow-up. Next slide, please. So I wanted to discuss making the decision. And so that can be, um, you know, maybe you've decided you want to use a centralized um, IBC and you're trying to decide which one, or maybe you're on the fence of whether to use one at all. Um, or maybe you have, you know, you've got a really small study, maybe three to five sites, you know, they're going to be local IBC sites and you're trying to decide if you're going to use concierge services or not. So um, with that said, you can use concierge services on their own. You do not have to use a centralized uh, central I IBC in order to employ concierge services. Um, but if you choose to, to employ a central um, IBC, you can take a look at this first link, the um, NIH registered IBCs. This is a listing of all registered IBCs. Um, so you can see if a site is registered to Advara or WCG or CBS or Brainy. Um, these are four of the major um, IBC service providers. Um, or you could see if they're simply registered to a local IBC or registered to any IBC at all. Now, with that said, we have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, this, this doesn't necessarily mean if they're not registered to a centralized service that they can't. It just means that they aren't yet. Um, but also, uh, the listing is not real time. So um, you may go to it and, and they may have recently registered with one of these services and it's just not showing up on the site yet. So, um, but definitely a, a good tool to, um, to see what your options are. Next slide. And um, this is just some additional um, support information for local IBC sites. So if you've decided uh, not to employ a central provider or, or concierge services, um, we do suggest that you take a look at completing um, what used to be called Appendix M. Um, and that way you are prepared to provide this to sites and you're not scrambling when they come with questions. So this Appendix M um, is based on uh, up until 2019, the, the NIH guidelines and, um, and all IBC applications are based off of uh, this previous Appendix M. Um, but basically, you just need the pharmacy manual, the protocol, and the IB to answer these questions. And um, with that, I'm going to hand this over to my colleague, Derek. Thanks so much, Kathy. Um, so I wanted to round out the discussion today with just additional considerations and trends that we've been seeing. Um, we just had uh, ASGCT last week, uh, among a number of other events around rare disease cell and gene therapy. So I wanted to do our best to summarize what we're seeing. Obviously, this can take um, a, almost an hour discussion just with these four boxes. So if there are any additional questions on any of these items, um, please don't hesitate to use the chat box, and we'll also provide our contact information at the end of this discussion. Um, first and foremost, our clinical holds. I think uh, in 2021, we saw a sharp increase, we being the entire industry, of the number of clinical holds assumed largely by uh, because of the number of cell and gene therapy trials. Uh, and what we saw was, although uh, cell and gene therapy trials uh, make up about less than 40% of all trials being currently run uh, of clinical holds, 40% of those clinical holds were of cell and gene therapy trials, which again is, is a pretty large number to hear, though uh, obviously there are some safety considerations that come into play when we look at cell and gene therapy compounds. Uh, most of those holds go lifted. Of course, we see that happen in oncology and hematology. The lowest rates that we've seen of, of clinical holds in cell and gene therapy kind of stick around in areas like neurology. Um, oncology, I, I believe, for the, when we looked over or when the analysts looked over the past 10 years or so in the published literature, uh, was responsible for more than half of those clinical holds. So again, um, uh, gives credence to, to really what uh, Chris was saying about the percentages of, of rare disease cell and gene therapy and oncology uh, cell and gene therapy. Uh, what's been really interesting from these clinical holds is a perceived class effect. Um, there are four um, 
companies, you know, not sure if they're on clinical hold or not, but you know, coming off of, of discussion of clinical hold and class effects, uh, four gene therapy companies, Pfizer, Sarepta, Genophon, and Solid Biosciences, partnered up in a pooled safety analysis for the Duchenne programs. And what they saw was in serious, in, in five patients that had SAEs or serious adverse events that had muscle weakness with, with cardiac involvement, uh, all of those patients had a, a genomic biomarker, a genetic mutation or a genetic variant um, that potentially caused this immune response to, to their mechanism of the AAV viral vector. Um, so there's, I think Pfizer is actively excluding those patients on trials going forward. Uh, the rest of the three, I'm not sure I've seen a decision yet, but again, just supports this thought of, even though it's the same mechanism, a different transgene, that patients can have a um, um, uh, immunological response uh, to that delivery model based upon genomic uh, markers. Uh, COVID-19, even though hopefully we are still um, kind of uh, almost out of, hopefully almost out of the pandemic, uh, still continues to impact us. Uh, Dana mentioned that there's been some hesitancy of patients coming into the clinic, and we certainly saw that in the start of the pandemic and almost at the peak of the pandemic. We're not really seeing that uh, too much with the rare disease patient population for our cell and gene therapy trials. But we did see, and we continue to see a little bit of uh, misinformation fueled by the pandemic. Um, we saw patients you know, interchangeably using the words RNA and DNA, or you know, I'm concerned about this integrating into my genome, which we didn't hear any of this kind of before the pandemic. So there could be, as Dana mentioned, pandemic-induced stressors involved in site activation. We're also seeing kind of this political piece of COVID kind of infiltrating into our clinical trials. So although we always uh, you know, preach for, for adequate patient education around cell and gene therapy, we almost need to combat kind of what we're seeing um, for things like pandemic when it starts to become a little bit polarized. I realized that I did skip a little about um, ASGCT findings. There was a lot that happened last week around discussions with FDA, discussions with NIH. Um, again, if there's a lot more we can discuss here, so certainly if you're interested, we can have a follow-up discussion. But most importantly, I think that we want to talk about is the development that happened last year of the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium, which is supported by both partnered industry partners and, and public partners as the NIH and the FDA. I'm looking to tackle four major obstacles related to cell and gene therapy, all around basic research, uh, clinical research, manufacturing and production, and regulatory requirements, with the goal of hopefully developing a playbook for all of our sponsors and hopefully us here at the CRO as well to help streamline, um, again, those mechanisms of actions, the, the development, the regulatory pathway, um, so that we don't need to reinvent the wheel each and every time. So a lot of fantastic insights from ASGCT that we'd be happy to share um, in, in a follow-up discussion. Last thing I wanted to talk about before we open up into to Q and A is around diversity. I think we're all well aware of the fact that the FDA recently released a, a draft guidance document on diversity within clinical trials and the importance of doing so. Um, when you think about rare diseases, of course, that, that is another challenge, another layer for, for our sponsors and us here at the CRO. Um, obviously, rare disease uh, has a lot of nuance and challenge in finding these patients um, in and of itself without even thinking about diversity. So when we start to look at diversity for rare disease patient population that are largely have a genetic uh, variant or the genetic rationale for why they have their disease, diversity can be something that our sponsors sponsors struggle with. Um, despite this, with the draft guidance document, it really is important to think about diversity in the development of your study, despite you targeting an X-linked disorder, for example. And I think it's an important time uh, in clinical development to shift our frame of thinking about how we address things like gender fluidity, how we address things in our ICFs and our protocols by saying males with an X-linked disorder, and, so, and, and maybe including something like individual with an excellent disorder or persons with an excellent disorder. Um, we do have a, a, had a scenario happen here at Worldwide um, that I, I will address in a question that came up around um, the involvement and the push for diversity in cell and gene therapy trials. With that, I will move to the next slide.
And again, thank you so much for attending our talks today. All of our emails are, are down below. Please use the chat box to ask any questions. We do have questions already. And, and with that, we'll, we'll open up to, to question and answer. Indeed we do. Thank you very much for that insightful presentation. I would like to invite the audience to continue sending their questions or comments right now using the questions window for this Q&A portion of the webinar. And as Derek has said, we've already received some questions, so we'll get ourselves started with those. Um, the very first question that I have here, and I believe this would be best directed towards Kathy, would like to know, how do we know if a site can use a central IRB and or IBC provider? Absolutely, thank you for that question. So um, what we typically do is leverage the provider first. So we would take our site list to them and ask them um, you know, which sites uh, they've worked with before. That's the first step. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean if they've not worked with them before though, that they cannot. So we also um, engage early on with the sites um, and try and uh, get this information. When we are selecting sites, we um, let them know who our provider is going to be and we actively have those conversations. Um, and then if they say no, uh, they cannot use them, then when using a centralized provider, we take the next step and the centralized provider um, will typically reach out to the site's IRB group and IBC. So um, at the CRO, we are engaging directly with um, regulatory coordinators. They don't necessarily, um, they're not kept fully informed of, of the IRB and IBC updates. So um, that next step by the provider reaching out directly to the IRB and IBCs does typically um, allow us to see some movement on um, sites being able to use uh, central providers. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, the next question I have here is for you, Dana, um, and I would like to know how do I get sites to be upfront about delays or backlogs uh, with clients and CROs? Yeah, great. Um, so kind of as I mentioned, you know, just being upfront, realistic with the uh, the response to your feasibility questionnaire. And then what I encourage uh, my team to do from a site activation perspective is once the site's selected, they get the regulatory packet in hand. They've had the opportunity to review the budget, um, you know, budget templates, protocol, all the uh, the core documents. And uh, we suggest a like a, a mini kickoff meeting with sites. So we'd have, you know, our, our site staff, our staff on it, you know, uh, the study coordinators and we kind of come together and we would come prepared with a, um, a projection plan and then we would present it to the site based off of the information you've given us this is kind of what we've mapped out and is this something that you guys are in agreement with and if not they don't feel like it's realistic then we kind of work together as a team and come to some timelines that everyone is in agreement and that are achievable on the site side so that's kind of what i would recommend Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, now, Derek, I have here the question you were mentioning a moment ago, um, asking, has the FDA included rare disease in its current guidance document on diversity? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and no, it, it, it hasn't for, for, I think, good reason. Um, they, they haven't typically, typically you can get a waiver for, for anything uh, for when it becomes a rare disease or orphan drug designation. But for this draft guidance document, no, there is no, um, exclusion or waiver for rare disease. In fact, there's a little uh, blurb in that document that does say, uh, if, if epidemiology is not well characterized or well known, um, please use real world evidence, literature review to support uh, that, that gap in your development. That's wonderful. Thank you very much for that question and for all of your answers today. Unfortunately, we have reached the end of our time here today. Uh, now, if we couldn't attend to your questions, though, uh, the team here at Worldwide Clinical Trials will follow up with you. Or if you have further questions, you can direct them to the email addresses that are up on your screen. I want to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen as you exit, and your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve our webinars. Now, I've also included a link in the chat box for the audience. Uh, with this link, you'll be able to view the recording of this event on this page, and you can share this link with your colleagues when they register for the recording here as well. So I encourage you to do that. Now, please join me once more in thanking our speakers for their wonderful time here today. We hope you all found the webinar informative. Have a great day, everyone, and thanks for coming.